Thank you for connecting back on this call. We've been talking about the prophetic in the Old Testament, and uh, we saw you know different ways in which it was expressed, uh, and also the fact that uh, it was only a few people who were anointed by the Holy Spirit who moved in the prophetic uh, in the Old Testament. But then you know we will see that in the New Testament. Every believer has this opportunity to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and also to manifest the gifts of the Spirit. So now we're at chapter 3, where we will see uh, experiences and, um, you know, different themes that have to do with the prophetic ministry in the New Testament. So the first person uh, who is talked about uh, is uh, John the Baptist. Okay. Now, with regard to uh, the prophetic, you know, there, there are a couple of things that we can learn from John the Baptist. So it is said that John the Baptist came uh, in the spirit and power of Elijah. So there is a, a connection that John the Baptist had with Elijah. Now, what is this connection? Now, we are told when Jesus uh, spoke about John the Baptist, you know, that he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom uh, of the just to make ready uh, people prepared for the Lord. Luke 1 verse 17. So what is this uh, spirit and power of Elijah? So basically it has to do with the anointing that Elijah carried. Uh, remember we said that though there is a transference of the anointing um, that we can experience that anointing does not look exactly like, like how it is on uh, a certain person's life. So though the anointing of Elijah was upon John the Baptist, it was not necessarily, you see Elijah, all those miraculous uh, incidents took place uh, in his ministry. So you cannot see something like that spoken of about John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist was bringing people to repentance. But here's, here's the, uh, the thing. We see that there was something like a way preparer or forerunner anointing you know, that Elijah carried. So he prepared the way for Elisha. So after Elijah came Elisha with a double portion. But who was before Elisha? Elijah. He made the path ready for that ministry of the miraculous. Now, John the Baptist, his anointing, you know, that comparable anointing or similar anointing uh, has to do with this forerunner or a pioneering, uh, 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 you know, anointing of God similar to that of Elijah. So that is the reason why we are told that John the Baptist will come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. So that is our uh, forerunner anointing of Elijah, which was upon John the Baptist. So there's a reference to that in the Gospels. And as I said, even Jesus spoke very, very highly uh, of uh, John the Baptist. Uh, in uh, Matthew 11, uh, verses 7 through 15, I'll just read one portion of it, maybe the last uh, portion there. For it says, okay, one second. Ah, uh, okay, I, Matthew 11, verses 7 through 15. Uh, I don't know exactly which verse this is, but uh, the part where it says, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. So you see, Jesus' affirmation of John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So, you know, Jesus goes on to talk many different things about him. Uh, and uh, towards the end, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah. See that comparison? Why is Jesus even comparing John the Baptist to Elijah? It's not so much because John is a prophet the way we understand prophets, but there is a prophetic anointing on John the Baptist's life. So Elijah, who is to come. So Jesus also makes a comparison. He uh, 
uh, he highly regards John the Baptist. Okay, right. So uh, that's a little bit about John the Baptist. Let's move on to Jesus. Um, Jesus, we know that he he carried uh, the power of God. No, the he carried the spirit without measure. That's how we read uh, about Jesus. So what is it's the spirit without measure? Uh, many interpretations say that spirit without measure is talking about all the anointings upon the life of Jesus. So all the fivefold uh, anointings and that Jesus was in all the fivefold offices. So Jesus uh, is an apostle. We know that because Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, he says uh, he's the apostle and high priest of our confession. So Jesus is a teacher. We obviously see that in his life. Uh, we we know that you know he uh, was somebody who drew people to himself. So he was in the ministry of an evangelist, but he was also in the ministry of the prophet. Uh, we we know that Jesus, you know, caring for the people, good shepherd. He was also in the office of a pastor. So in this section, we are going to look at Jesus as a prophet. He walked as a prophet. In fact, he is our chief prophet. Uh, among all those who carry that anointing for the office, he is the chief prophet. So Moses, many uh, decades many centuries before Jesus said something like, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. From your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. Who was Moses prophesying about? He was talking about the Lord Jesus. Now, in the book of Acts, you know, you see a reference to these statements talking about Jesus once again, where even the first century believers knew that Moses was talking about the Lord Jesus. So Jesus is in the prophetic office and he is the one who is the chief of all prophets uh, and talking about himself. You know, remember the time when uh, people were opposing Jesus and they were not valuing him. He made a statement. He said, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Who is he talking about? Himself. And what is he saying? He's saying, I'm a prophet. No prophet is accepted in his own country. So even Jesus affirmed it and said that I am a prophet. And people also recognized him as a prophet. There are statements such as, a great prophet has risen up among us. God has visited his people. You know, things like this were spoken about the Lord Jesus. Okay. Now, how did this prophetic anointing manifest in the life of Jesus? Uh, we can see that there were times when uh, Jesus knew the hearts of the people. Remember, it, it says in, in portions of scripture that uh, he already knew what they were thinking so how did he know through the prophetic anointing okay he was fully god he was fully man we know right that he left behind his his attribute of omniscience knowing everything when he became a man he was limited in his un, in, in his knowledge that is why he had to grow uh, in wisdom in stature and uh, in favor with man and god but at the same time because of the operation of the anointing, there are portions of scripture that say that he already knew what they were thinking in their hearts. So that is the prophetic in operation. Um, there were times when Jesus could reveal the true character of people uh, like Nathaniel. You know, here is a man without guile. How does Jesus know what the character of an individual is? Jesus was saying he's a good man or Peter he looked at Peter and said you are the rock whereas we know that in if Jesus were to talk about Peter based on his uh, uh, his behavior he was very unstable but Jesus said you are the rock because he knew what was coming how Peter would end up being one of those key leaders uh, in the early church. So the character of people through the prophetic anointing, Jesus was able to um, uh, release or proclaim it. He even exposed, you know, secret thoughts and sins uh, of, of uh, people's hearts. So 
how did he know all this through the prophetic anointing so such were the manifestations that we see in uh, the life of Jesus, but not just limited to that. Uh, there's also passages like uh, Matthew chapter 24 and 25, where he talks about the end of the age. So what is that? Isn't it speaking? Isn't it prophetic words about what is going to happen? Uh, you know, to to the world and the world events. Uh, there will be earthquakes. There will be famines. So as a prophet the lord jesus released all these words and uh, you know we see the ministry through his life okay what else is there in the uh, new testament the early church and uh, uh, the day of pentecost which was a very crucial day in the life of the church you know many believe that the birth of the church was on that day uh, of pentecost so acts chapter 2 over there, we had 12 apostles, 120, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, rest 120 who are waiting upon the Lord uh, at the church in Jerusalem. And, you know, the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. So once this happened, the ministry of the church began and we read about uh, many different people in the early church volunteers uh, there were witnesses like Stephen there were evangelists like Philip there were also prophets so uh, the earliest reference to prophets is in acts chapter 11 where we see an established church in uh, antioch of syria and over there there was a prophetic team that was sent by the jerusalem church now these prophets they came from jerusalem to antioch and among them was a man called Agabus. Now, Agabus, when you read about Agabus in, in the book of Acts, he is a prophet. Okay? He's referred to as a uh, prophet. And he was the one who predicted uh, the days of famine, the great famine throughout all the world, which uh, happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. And when he gave this prophetic word about uh, the the calamity okay it was helpful because we know that the church started um, some initiative they started collecting money and they started uh, you know working on sending aid to uh, different places so remember earlier when um, i think jeffina brought that question can the prophetic word have something unpleasant in it yes it can so imagine agabus saying that there's going to be famine it's not at all nice to hear a prophetic word like that but you see god's goodness in that prophetic word is that god is telling us beforehand what is going to happen so that we can prepare for it it's helpful isn't it so uh, god is a restorer redeemer we shouldn't forget that okay so agabus was a notable prophet and once uh you know uh, these prophets came from jerusalem we read in the in uh, uh, the book of acts that many teachers and prophets developed in the church see when there is the anointing that came to the Antioch church. Okay, it's a it's another growing church, like a sister church um, uh, in in um, uh, uh, what do you say in the region. But once the prophetic anointing came there, soon we read that many teachers and prophets were raised up in the church in a period of about two to three years. So we can only uh, we can only understand this as you know maybe an impartation took place. Once the prophets came, that many other prophets started to rise up in the church. And then you, you see the flow of the prophetic in Acts chapter 13, when the leaders of the Antioch church, they are praying and they're ministering unto God. You know, God gives them a word and he says, okay, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. So what's happening? You know, there are ministries that people are being called to even this is prophetic isn't it god speaking to them and telling them the direction of the ministry for that antioch church from that point onwards so something is stirred up in the church of antioch once the prophets came there uh, so we can learn from this oh there is value there is impartation when when we have uh, you know the the prophetic anointing come in to the uh, congregation so you know 
then the word of the Lord uh, w w came to them, and uh, there was this new ministry, if you want to call it, which is a more like a missionary apostolic ministry that was uh, that started from Acts chapter 13. And then you know you had Barnabas and Saul who they start journeying, they start going to new places. So all of this is seen. Uh, uh, in the book of Acts in the early church. So a couple of other things that we can uh, we, we can see is, yeah, there was an issue in Acts chapter 15 where um, the people were asking the question, if Gentiles become believers, should they also be circumcised? Okay, so this was a question which uh, which created contention among the people because if you look at even the church of Antioch, there were, it, it was a Gentile church. Okay, Many people were coming from the Gentile background and accepting Christ. Now, uh, should we put, put a rule and, and say that the Gentile believers should also fo follow the uh, Jewish traditions or not? Okay, so these questions arose. But we see a very beautiful account of how uh, this was dealt with. So we have Paul and some folks go to the church in Jerusalem, meet with the leaders of the Jerusalem church uh, regarding this question. And you know they have what is known as the Jerusalem council. They all discuss. And when they discuss, right, uh, even there, we, we see that, you know, when they discuss, after that, sort of God gives all of them the peace about the decision that they make that no gentiles don't have to be circumcised but then there are some other uh, you know uh, some other uh, guidelines which we can give the gentiles like don't worship uh, uh, like uh, you know don't do certain sacrifices and all because uh, now the jewish and the gentile communities had to uh, had to live in a cordial way now that everyone people were becoming believers from both the community so that was the final decision but the holy spirit gave them peace regarding this matter and in acts chapter 15 we also read about people like judas and silas they were prophets and they exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words so there were more prophets now you know we read about agabus but now you have judas silas all these people and later, uh, we we find that uh, some of them even go ahead and they start traveling with Apostle Paul. So um, these are you know prophets because we are looking at the prophetic right uh, in the early church. Who else uh, is there? Uh, we've read about uh, Agabus, Judas, Silas. Now another interesting uh, thing is that in Acts chapter two, we know uh, the scripture said that your son and daughters shall prophesy okay sons and daughters shall prophesy uh, and in acts chapter 21 remember this uh, evangelist philip who went to samaria and uh, he did the work of god in samaria he had four daughters and it is said that philip's daughters prophesied so obviously um, seems like they had some sort of a uh, prophetic ministry they could have been believers who prophesied but since it is mentioned they prophesied it's likely they had some sort of a prophetic ministry so even women uh, were prophesying in the early church so these are all accounts of uh, the prophetic uh, in the in the early church Yes. So in Acts 21, again, Agabus makes another very important uh, prophecy where uh, he tells Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Uh, OK, look at this. He says that uh, whoever, you know, the man whose belt this is, so he takes uh, Paul's belt and uh, he sort of, you know, binds himself with that belt. and his own hands and feet and he says thus says the holy spirit so shall the jews at jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the gentiles so that is the prophetic word okay that paul if you go to jerusalem you are going to be caught you you will be taken into custody that's what agabus is saying now did paul know about this even paul knew that this is what is going to happen However, in 
addition to the prophetic word, Agabus and the others were telling him, Paul, don't go. Now, Paul, don't go was not a prophetic word. You are going to be caught is a prophetic word. But Paul, don't go is something that came out of their own hearts because they did not want Paul to face difficulties. So you see there, uh, uh, not everything is prophecy. There was prophecy, but there was something that came out of people's hearts, uh, out of their love for Paul. And they were saying, hey, we don't want you to go through all this, Paul. So don't go to Jerusalem. And Paul said, no, no, I have to go. This is what God is calling me to. So I'm going to go to uh, Jerusalem. So these are things that we see in the New Testament. Now, as we move ahead, you know, we see Paul's explanation about the gift of prophecy. Okay, And uh, I, I'm not going to uh, touch on this, uh, at least some of the points, because it will be a repetition. Uh, many of us asked a lot of questions. So by now, you probably have an idea already. So we'll see you know, how much should be covered here. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as we've already said, you know, there are, there are the gifts of the Spirit which are listed out for us. I think it's very important for us to read this passage. So could somebody read it? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Huh? Yeah, you can read. 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 11. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinction between kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And He gives them to each one just as He determines. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Jeffina. So here we've seen that the Holy Spirit manifests himself through these uh, diverse gifts. And we also noted that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of also. What are the gifts of the Spirit supposed to do? They are supposed to benefit. They are supposed to help. They are supposed to uh, profit every believer or the body of believers now there is a list of the gifts so there is the word of wisdom uh, there is the word of knowledge there is faith there is gifts of healings uh, there is working of miracles prophecy discerning of spirits and different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. So this is the list of at least nine things that we see here. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So Holy Spirit is the same, but he brings these there are nine manifestations that are listed. Why these manifestations? For the profit of all, so that the body of believers will be blessed. That is the reason God has given us all these gifts. So here we read about the gift of prophecy. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3, it says, He who prophesies edify, he, uh, sorry, it says uh, it brings edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. So the purpose of 
the gift of prophecy you know we've understood edification exhortation and comfort to men and we've seen this earlier and that the prophecy or prophetic gift in verse 4 it says that it edifies the church edifies is strengthen so it will strengthen the church this is why god has given prophecy and we will look at it in a deeper way later uh, now this what we have talked about is the simple gift of prophecy and i've explained about it earlier or you know sometimes they say basic gift of prophecy okay what is the next progression next level in the progression here grace gift of prophecy grace gift of prophecy and i think they also call it membership uh, gifts so in romans chapter 12 verses 4 through 8 uh, it says for as we have many members in one body but all the members do not have the same function so we being many are one body in christ and individually members of one another having then gifts okay membership gifts having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us let us use them see here membership gift grace gift of prophecy so god gives the grace for a prophetic ministry let us use them and there first in the list if prophecy let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry let us use it in our ministering he who teaches in teaching he who exhorts in exhortation he who gives with liberality he who leads with diligence he who shows mercy with cheerfulness so a couple of things that we can understand here prophecy is one of the membership gifts as well earlier what did we see gift of the holy spirit prophecy which is simple gift of prophecy now membership gift of prophecy or we can also say grace because this is according to the grace which is given to us uh, and what other what other information can we get here it says he who if prophecy let us prophesy in proportion to our faith so our level of operating in the prophetic depends on our level of faith. So the greater faith we have or the greater faith we develop for the prophetic gift, we can keep going higher and higher and higher in releasing or manifesting this gift of prophecy. So what does this membership gift or grace gift uh, mean? We uh, understand that you know, some people have that that grace to uh, move in a, in a greater measure in the prophetic gift so they have a prophetic ministry we also use the term prophetic ministry see prophetic ministry is different from a believer prophesying believers can prophesy but we will not say that they have a prophetic ministry see i can release a hun few hundred prophecies through my life or 200 or even a thousand prophecies but that doesn't make me a person with a prophetic ministry. You get it? So believers can move in the prophetic. They can release prophecies. But there is a grace given to some people who uh, have this membership gift of prophetic ministry. So their ministry is prophetic. Okay, so that's how we would look at this. Now, moving on to the next level in the progression is the office of a prophet or you would also say ministry gift of prophet. Now, what gift is this? Okay, let's see. Uh, Jesus himself gave it in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Uh, let me read it because all these passages are very important. We should know what they say. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ so for a certain outcome what is that uh, the equipping of the saints, for the edifying of the body, for the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God, and also the maturing of the believer, you know, helping them uh, become that perfect man 
we are talked about we are talking about perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ so these things have to be achieved equipping of the saints edifying of the body all these things have to be achieved how are we going to achieve this what jesus has done is he has given gifts who are these gifts we are told that he gives the fivefold uh, people in the fivefold ministry offices and their job is to work on all these outcomes so as they do what their anointing calls them to do function as an apostle function as a prophet function as a teacher function as a pastor what's happening these outcomes will be seen in the body of christ but notice here that he himself gave some to be apostles so here it very clearly says earlier we said gift of prophecy all can move in it right but here god is already chosen jesus has appointed so there are people who are appointed he himself gave some to be apostles some prophets so there are people who are called in by god into these offices so this is not something that we can desire and get it from god no unless god has appointed us in these ministry offices it's not possible for us to uh, step into the office or have the ministry gift of uh, you know an apostle prophet or anything like that again first corinthians 12:28 it sort of uh, strengthens what we just read and god has appointed these in the church first apostles second prophets third teachers after that miracles then gifts of healings helps administrations variety of tongues okay uh, right so we have an idea now about the levels of progression and this is all in the new testament and that is why you know we we are trying to get a uh, uh, grip of these truths okay so one thing is clear that uh, god has appointed apostles and prophets in the old testament uh, you know we've seen the work of the prophets in the early church we've seen the work of uh, those 12 apostles those 12 apostles when we study about apostolic ministry we will understand this in a deeper way um, so they were known as the apostles of the lamb and also we know that uh, scriptures tell us that god is building the church on the foundation of uh, apostles and prophets so they there was a certain kind of apostolic and prophetic ministry which uh, they were functioning in uh, on which you know the church has been established but today today uh, the apostolic and the prophetic is very much alive but the way the anointing plays out or manifests itself can be different as compared to the early church uh, you know apostles and prophets okay so it can be similar in in some ways but then uh, there can also be a certain differences so why does god want apostles and prophets to continue to strengthen you know the foundations of the church to rebuild sometimes foundations of uh, local churches by bringing uh, the word of the lord uh, to confirm to clarify a god given vision or even to provide direction to a local church which is progressing uh, in the in the purpose of god sometimes they Uh, you know come and restore order if order is is uh, uh, you know instead of order there is chaos they come and restore it so these are all the key things that uh, god wants done through the apostolic and the prophetic offices um, so even today you know we might ask the question what does the ministry gift of the prophet do uh, so the ministry gift of the prophet it will as i said something to do with strengthening foundation so uh, uh, they will continue to lay a strong uh, doctrinal foundation for the people they will hear from god and they will announce uh, you know certain moves of god uh, or they they will guide on what the holy spirit wants right now uh, and what the holy spirit wants in the ministry remember acts 13 till that time yes people were traveling but not in a way that barnabas and paul started doing after acts 13 but the holy spirit came and the holy spirit spoke to them and said come on now is the next season go 
you know till now you were just here around here close to jerusalem now go on you know spread to different parts so that's what we mean when we say moves of god directives of god uh, also announcing you know the the mind of god to the larger larger body of christ uh, to the cities and nations so these are all things that uh, the the prophets would do remember agabus how he spoke and he said hey there's going to be a time when there will be a famine and all so uh, the prophets will continue to do things like this and there could be issues within the church okay uh, which need a revelation from god to solve so if we recall in acts 15 it was a very critical phase when they had to make a decision should or uh, should the gentiles not get circumcised but thank god with the work of the spirit you know they they were able to address this matter by hearing from god and uh, they established order in church government or uh, the way the church should function that's what we call church government uh, and, and that was a blessing to the wider body of christ so throughout the region uh, you know it was declared it was decreed it was announced that look if gentiles are coming to christ then they don't have to get circumcised they simply have to stay away from certain uh, Uh, so, uh certain practices so uh, this is this is what uh, you know we we have seen in the progression and the functions of these three levels so uh what is the distinguishing feature of these three levels in the prophetic progression uh well you know we've said that we've said that there are three realms of influence isn't it so the realm of influence is very different in the basic uh, gift of prophecy our influence is there but it's not as much as somebody who carries the grace gift of prophecy or uh, the person who is in the prophetic ministry their influence is not as much as the one who is in the prophetic office so the realms of influence vary we could also say that the measure of the anointing varies okay obviously when we are saying progression there's a greater anointing when somebody is in the prophetic office uh, and yeah so these things are, are what are different you know the boundaries of operation um, of these gifts i think we've uh, covered uh, most of what we needed to sign believer uh, yeah so we we've, we've talked about everything else earlier so if there's any specific question you have you know you can stop me and we can uh, talk about it uh, for a little while otherwise i i will continue yes yes divya thank you thank you pastor um my question is uh, about uh, uh, the so uh, the second one that you told was membership gift and the third is ministry gifts yeah so uh, uh, what what is the uh, like i don't know whether you'll be covering it in the next section but uh, like what is the essential difference between uh, like membership and uh, uh, ministry because uh, isn't it both of them are like uh, you know are for uh, the purpose of the church edification so what gen what is uh, the real difference between these two and yeah. yes so divya as i said uh, it is the the boundaries of operation the influence so somebody who has the membership gift or the grace gift of prophecy um they are operating at a greater level than a prophesying believer but not as much as the one who is in the office so that influence level of influence varies okay and we we also see that the measures of the anointing varies so somebody who is in the prophetic office is functioning at a way greater measure of anointing as compared to somebody who is in the prophetic ministry so it's mainly uh, the influence levels of influence and the measure of anointing which is different okay okay so uh, i think this is like a follow up on a question that i had asked earlier mm -hmm. uh, so in the old testament uh, 
is there like a distinction like this, uh, like a ministry, like a person in office of the prophet or operating in the membership gift? Any distinction like that? Yeah. So that's what I uh, clarified earlier, Divya. In the Old Testament, you see direct office of a prophet, sort of ministry only. Isn't it? All the Gad, uh, the Nathan, Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, uh, Ezekiel. So the 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 prophetic anointing comes upon them, and generally, you know, they uh, they and it it sort of repeats upon the lives of these men and women. And, and so we understand that they are prophets, and they were even called as prophets. So they were all in the they were all functioning under the office of a prophet kind of an anointing okay just that because in the old testament it doesn't talk about the different levels we don't mention it but that's the comparison okay nearly all of them are prophets we directly call them prophets and one or two as i said you know saul he was prophesying even the donkey prophesied so uh it's not about levels when they came under the influence, like even those 70 elders, they came under the influence to some extent as a one-off thing. Prophecy came, but that's about it. Okay, So invariably, in the Old Testament, our way of thinking is when there was a prophetic anointing, it was on the prophets. They were all prophets. They were in the office of the prophet. Whereas in the New Testament, you have a progression, right? So not everybody is in the office of a prophet. All can prophesy, okay? But there are some who are in the office of... So that whole progression, that distinction, all that is for the New Testament. You don't have anything like that in the Old Testament. Yes. Yeah, so when when you mention anoint, when the anointing came, it is just like saying when the Holy Spirit came on them, right? Because, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And also, I wanted to ask you, like, uh, how 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 can one identify? Like, how can a believer identify whether they are called into you know uh, this uh, an office of the prophet or uh, whether it is a you know ministry. Uh, like membership gift. So how how is that a believer can identify that? Okay. Um, so there are both ways. One can know from the beginning that they are called into a certain office because God has revealed it okay, to them. Uh, so that is a possibility where, uh, let's, you know, like for example, uh, Saul. Okay, Saul, uh, he accepted uh, Christ and then, you know, that whole thing happens. He goes blind and then Ananias comes to him. But you see, uh, right around that time, it was given to, to Saul, like what he is going to do. So in the beginning itself, God can reveal and say, hey, I've called you as an apostle. I've called you as a teacher to the body. I've called you as a prophet. So people can know. but. It can also be the other way, where one doesn't know which office they are called into, uh, but the manifestation of the prophetic anointing through their lives. You know, as time goes by, they are increasing in the measures. And at some point, everyone around them recognizes that they are in the prophetic office, and they themselves also recognize that they are in the prophetic office. So it can happen both ways. You can know beforehand. Or you learn eventually. I hope uh, that answers your question. Yeah, sure, sure, Pastor. I, I had one more question. Uh, uh, it is regarding the, this is something that you mentioned earlier, like uh, during the initial class classes. Uh, so uh, you mentioned something like uh, uh, a prophecy is always uh, followed by uh, intercession or a prayer kind of something like that but a prayer doesn't need to uh, be uh, you know have a prophecy uh, uh, like prior to that so uh, is it always like that because if we look at uh, some of the old testament 
um, we may we may we might have exceptions, right? Where there was there was not an intercession that followed uh, the prophecy. Yeah. So just wanted to clarify that. Uh, sure, Divya. So see the meaning of uh, what or what I implied was one needs a prayer life or uh, a connect with God to be able to flow in. Uh, the prophetic ministry or prophecy so without prayer we cannot grow in the prophetic okay it's not so much prophetic intercession i'm just saying when we have a strong prayer life the way abraham did uh, he you know he was flowing in the prophetic now the other way around other way around is um, one can be prayerful but they need not be prophetic so one cannot be prophetic without prayer, but one can be prayerful without being prophetic. Okay, so that's what I implied. I hope it's clear this time. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yes, I got it. Yes. Okay, right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, so, Pastor, I just want to know whether I'm understanding right. So, in Acts chapter 21, we see uh, Philip's daughters uh, prophesying. So, and then Agabus comes. So, Agabus is actually in the office of prophecy. I mean, I just want to know whether I'm understanding. I in my perspective, I think Agabus is from the office of prophecy. So, the daughters, whether they were members of the prophecy or, or they were just believers who prophesied. Uh -huh. Good question. Good question. Uh, Jepina, so over there what you see is we, we uh, like uh, Philip's daughters they prophesied it says okay so nothing more is given to us so we can only interpret it okay with with what we have understood Agabus clear cut he's in the office of a prophet that's okay now the daughters of Philip my understanding is uh, they were more than women who prophesied. I feel like that because, you see, uh, everyone could prophesy. So if everyone is prophesying, there's no special mention. Now, these women must have had a prophetic ministry. That is the only reason, especially they have, it's being told that Philip's four daughters, they prophesied. So that's my understanding, Jeffina. They probably had a prophetic ministry it's a it's it's a sort of a calculated guess okay pastor so uh, we can actually classify like this right i mean when we see someone prophecy or prophecy uh, when the bible says we can really think like whether they are believers or <laughs> members or they are from the office. okay yeah. okay so we have the progression and this whole technical you know and progression is for us to understand and gain an understanding so i would say yes we may be able to uh, look at somebody and classify them in one of the three sections but frankly enjoy the gift of prophecy don't worry too much about you know are who's who where are they where am i am i here so don't worry too much about it yeah thank you best yeah sure all right, so I think we've run out of time. Uh, we will uh, wrap up with a word of prayer. I uh, want to encourage uh, someone to quickly come in and please lead us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful class that we had. God, we thank you for the gift of prophecy. God, we thank you that you're a God who speaks with us. God, we thank you for you're always there to guide us, to edify us. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for the people who are uh, helping us through these prophecies. And we thank you so much for filling us who are just a broken vessel. But you have filled us with these gifts, filled us with these treasures. As we learn more about it, help us to seek your word more, seek your kingdom more, and to uh, get more deeper about this gift so that we can edify others for your kingdom, so that we can encourage others and lift up others uh, to live a life that glorifies you, and we ourselves can live a life that glorifies you. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. Thank you, everyone. God bless you.
uh, have a wonderful week. We'll meet again next week. God bless. Bye for now.